I was an agriculturalist. And I tried to get all I could for the land. But since that time, I've realized that this land is not just a resource to be used, abused. It's something that we have to take care of and look at all of it. We have to go back to the way it was if we're gonna save these precious natural resources we've been given to enjoy. Over the last several decades, we've been losing thousands and thousands of acres of our wetland habitat. Oil and gas, livestock production, agricultural producers, you name it. When you look at what the prairie used to be, you've lost all that water storage. The river has some parts that are breathtakingly beautiful, but there are other places you want to cry because it's so dirty. And it's all the same river. Right now, we have an opportunity to take this gem, polish it off, and show it to the world. The situation for fishing in state waters was just terrible, and we decided we were gonna do something about it. You gotta wanna do it. You gotta wanna be in this business. I've been going out there so long, it's just part of me now. Here's my take. Every bend is a new adventure. It's just you and nature. I'm kind of the steward for this land that's here. Hopefully I leave it better than the way I found it. Well, good morning, everyone. It is such a joy to see each and every one of you today. For those of you who I don't know, I'm Joni Carswell. I'm the CEO at Texan by Nature, and welcome to the 2023 Texan by Nature Conservation Summit. So excited to have each of you here. So today, we will discuss the future. That's always the theme of our summits. We'll discuss the future through examples, through lessons and vision given across four panels. So I hope you're ready to, to think and engage and really think about what you're gonna take home. These will dive deep on the keys to conservation's future. Education, application, measurement, and reporting. The things that I've been talking with a lot of you about for not only the last 12 months, but the last six years. So we're gonna really dive into the examples today. But first I wanna start the day with some appreciation, appreciation to and for so many of you here. I'd like to thank our sponsors and our members, your partnership, your enthusiasm, it enables the work that we do every single day. Thank you to our sustainability fund leaders, the Stillwater Foundation, Ray and Becky Engel, John Now, HEB, the Friedkin Group, Karen Hickson, Colin Geiselman, Cynthia Pickett-Stevenson, and the Kinder Foundation, and of course, Enbridge. Thank you guys so much for being part of the Sustainability Fund. And our sincere, yes, thank you. Our sincere gratitude also goes to Lida Hill Philanthropies for supporting all of our partner work and operations on an ongoing basis, and HEB and Enbridge for supporting our Conservation Wrangler Program and Summit at the highest level every single year. Thank you to NRG Reliant, EOG Resources, and DD Rose for their continued support of the summit and the program as well. Thank you guys. Thank you to our silver and bronze sponsors and to the Garden Club of Dallas. I don't know if you guys have already seen the beautiful flowers, but that's courtesy of, of the Garden Club of Dallas, so thank you very much. We are so proud to be supported by a diverse, committed group of partners from all across the state and from so many different industries and walks of life. As you see the partners throughout the day, if you would thank them for supporting conservation work and all of the partner work that we do for the 145 partners that we have. Please note uh, that the, the member and the sponsor names that I mentioned from the stage, they are a sampling, if you will. They're the ones who are supporting directly the conservation program, conservation wrangler program in this summit. But there are many more organizations that I, I did not name that are doing amazing work. They're underwriting different projects and they're doing their own projects. And you can find more about those at texanbynature.org. 
So I'd also like to thank all of the Texan by Nature board members for their continued commitment to conservation and to Texan by Nature. Lara Bush, Elaine Magruder, Tamara Trail, Tina Buford, Joe Crafton, Ray Ingle, Carolyn Miller, Cynthia Pickett-Stevenson, Robert Horton, thank you for being here today. Roxanne Newman and Reagan Gammon, thank you for joining us online. And finally, thank you to the Texan by Nature staff. You guys are amazing each and every day. I count myself lucky to learn from you and lucky to wor work alongside of you. Ginny Burden, Taylor Keyes, Karina Araujo, Terry Pearsall, Orvi Donny, Kinsey Cherniak, Caitlin Tran, Amy Snellgrove, who's here with us here in spirit, Danielle Blanco, Brandis Nelson, Carolyn Cooper, Estella Lopez, Madeline Coletta, and Kate, Captain Keatron. Thank you guys so much for putting on a wonderful event today. So we want every person to engage in dialogue today, whether you're in person and we'll have mics going around the room after each panel or you're joining us virtually. For virtual attendees, please engage live on the YouTube stream. We'll be checking that for any questions or commentary and getting to you. But if you prefer, you can also email info at texanbynature.org. Uh, we'll be looking for those virtual questions throughout the day. So show of hands, how many of you have been to the summit before? Okay, so for the virtual audience, it was about 50, 55% have been to the summit before. Welcome back to those that, that we do see annually and welcome to all the new faces. We are so excited to have you. A few ground rules, the, the folks who have been here before know these, but a few for the, for the new ones, cell phones, silence them now please, <laughs> or even turn them off. Uh, you know, we really want to set up the day for conversation, so go ahead, look at your phone, put it on silence, and get ready to, to learn from our panelists and, and to engage with other attendees. So the future of conservation. Future of conservation. This is a lofty theme for discussion that we sit, set every single year. As an organization with a mission to advance conservation, this is actually something that we talk about on an ongoing basis internally at Texan by Nature. We talk about it in relation to all of our programs, and then we also put a lot of planning each year into the day that, that we're about to experience. We laser focus on the future. What topics, what examples, what speakers that we bring in today will break, lead to the greatest advancement of conservation and the, the brightest future. So we're incredibly excited, delighted, all of the superlatives to see where this day leads and excited to have you here with us. But in preparation, last week, the Texan My Nature team went down a little bit of a rabbit hole. Uh, we were talking about walk-up songs. Everybody know what a walk-up song is? It's, you know, that, that song that plays when you go up to bat. Way to go, Rangers. Um, <laughs> or or when, you, when you walk up to something important, right? It's your theme song. It's your hype song. And the Texan team had some great, some questionable um, um, songs that, that, that came up as, as the choices for our walk-up songs. But one song kept really coming to mind for me. And it's not a theme song or a hype song, but it's a song that always comes to mind for me when I think about the future and when I think about impact and, and a song that really just, it, it stays with you. So how many of you have seen the musical Rent? Okay, so at least half the audience. For those who have, I apologize, I'm a little bit sorry because the song that's about to be stuck in your head is probably gonna be there all day, sorry. <laughs> but I do think it's appropriate for how we're thinking about the day, um, even though it's different than the context of the musical. In the production, there is a song that talks about measuring a year, 525,600 minutes. It's the amount of time in the year and it talks about how will you measure it? What will you do with that? How will you make the most of that year? I saw that musical when I was 20 years old, aging myself a little bit, but the song has always stuck with me. What are we gonna do with the next year? What are we gonna do with the next three years? How am I gonna make a difference? What's gonna go on over the next decade? What are we gonna learn? What are we gonna to start to finish, to replicate, 
to expand? What commitments are we going to make? I love the action of it. It's all about what are you going to do and how are you going to measure it? How are you going to measure it in that, that 500,000 plus minutes? So today we have the opportunity to learn about new practices and to meet new partners. We've put together a day based on what we've heard and what we've seen as the biggest needs and opportunities in conservation right now. We'll talk about reaching stakeholders effectively, applying practices and making decisions, measuring and reporting results, and above all, working together, being collaborative in achieving lofty results for conservation. So we'll talk about the intersection of ESG goals and conservation action, sustainability goals, however you want to label it, corporate sustainability goals and conservation, expectations of what, what are future generations expecting and expectations for future generations, population growth and impact. Our goals with the material shared today, we always sit down and we, we create a list. What do we want people to leave with today? And our goals today with this discussion, our hope for the next year, is that we leave here today and we work together. That's the, the overarching. That we seek, we understand, and we apply best practices. That we learn from those who are maybe a little bit ahead of us on the curve and we take that home and we apply it. And that when we find something that's working, we share it in a standard metrics-based repeatable way so that we're always building on one another for a future that is bright. So as you're sitting today, now that your, your phones are all silenced, I appreciate that. I want you to think about what you're going to take home. I want you to get in that mindset. What does conservation mean to you? What are you working on right now? What do you want to learn more about? What, what are your barriers? What are things that are, are, are difficult for you? I want you to think about who you're already partnering with and maybe how you could deepen that or, or make that more successful and maybe people who you need to partner with moving forward. Think about what you're going to apply and think about what are we going to do over the next year until we get back together again. So let's get started. Karina and our first panel speakers, if you could come up here. From the mountains of West Texas to the playas, to the pine woods and everything in between, it's vital that all Texans are connected to the land. It's where our clean water comes from, where our food is grown, and it's where the iconic wildlife species of Texas call home. But with population growth across the state, we've become more and more disconnected from the land that we cherish and depend on. If you don't understand something, it's hard to value it, and it's hard to take care of it. So at Texas Wildlife Association, we're trying to create connections to the land for Texans and help them understand the very important role that private landowners have in the health, abundance, and sustainability of those natural resources. percent of Texas is privately owned. That means it can be a challenge to find a place to just go and hunt, go fish, go hiking. Texas Wildlife Association is a landowner and hunter advocacy organization. We were formed in 1985 to make sure that private landowners and hunters had a strong voice in the natural resource policy issues that affected them. Private landowners are the key to successful wildlife management, plain and simple. Without them, it just doesn't work. That's why building a statewide membership of engaged landowners is at the heart of what TWA does. TWA understands that you can't just put a fishing pole in a kid's hand, plop him on the side of a pond, and expect him to become a conservationist. There has to be an educational component, and TWA is a master at that. We strive to achieve our mission here at Texas Wildlife Association through a three-pronged approach. Issues and advocacy, hunting recruitment and retention, and natural resource education. We'll take the Texas Youth Hunting Program, for example. In 2022, 
We were able to take over 1,200 kids on 225 different hunts around the state. And that doesn't happen by accident. It takes a lot of pieces coming together. Strong partners like our friends at Texas Parks and Wildlife Department. It takes an army of trained volunteers that we call hunt masters. And it also takes generous, dedicated landowners that are willing to open their gates to share their resources with a large group of Texas citizens. Private property is not a bug, but a feature of why Texas has such abundant wildlife and diversity of wildlife. Picture a busload of children going on to a beautiful piece of property that has abundant wildlife, plants, and everything else, just the cornucopia of stuff. Something happens, it doesn't take that long, a few trips, where they all of a sudden, th their perspective changes. There's a relationship that was built in that moment that will be with that child forever. You see some really meaningful outcomes at these various events. Children, adults, they can find a place that's accessible to go hiking or fishing. It's things most Texans don't see in the middle of town, but it's things that you can see out on a well-managed piece of private property. And so those decisions that private landowners are making are affecting you and me all around the state, whether we know it or not. We feel that willingness to go engage in the outdoors will help them understand why it's so important to conserve wild things in wild places. TWA wants to reach more people, more landowners. If you care about these things, partner with them on their program so that you can share with other people what you have. The population in Texas is expected to go from 30 million to 50 million by 2050. The decisions we make now are gonna be very important to the future of our state, and we need you involved here at TWA. All landowners, big, small, urban, rural, there's never been a better time to be connected, to be informed and understand the value of our land and the natural resources on it. Karina Araujo, Marketing Manager at Texan by Nature. For each panel today, the moderator will introduce all the panelists. They'll share their presentations in succession, and after the final speaker, we'll have time for a live Q&A from the audience. Uh, we'll take questions from our virtual audience as well, so if you're virtual, please submit your questions via info at texanbynature.org or on the YouTube stream. Google conservation and you'll receive over 2 billion results in less than a second. Over 2 billion. We're living in an age of extreme information. According to a report by the University of California, San Diego, the average American consumes about 74 gigabytes of information every day. That's estimated to be the equivalent of 100,000 words heard or read every day, or about the equivalent of number of words on J.R.R. Tolkien's The Hobbit. It's a lot of words. <laughs> it's hard to believe that each one of us consumes that much content each and every day. Even more, it's estimated that we're experiencing 5% growth on that content each and every day. Each and every year, I'm sorry, that would be a lot. <laughs> so in a world where there's so much information right at our fingertips and we're constantly bombarded with new information to consume and digest, how do we find the information that we're searching for? And how do we reach the audiences that we want to educate and engage? As Texas population grows, and the disconnect between urban dwelling and open spaces increases, what channels and methods will help us engage each person in conservation 
even though they may be more removed from nature than any previous generation. Our first panel will lay the foundation for today. George Washington Carver once said, education is the key to unlock the golden door of freedom. And he was absolutely right. Education is also the key to conservation's future. And a critical part of that future is understanding how data and information overload shape our messaging moving forward. And how can we not only reach people, but provide education that leads to participation, to application of best practices, whether you're a leader in industry, a landowner, a community leader, an urban dweller, a suburbanite, or a combination of many of these. Today we'll hear examples of education programs, community initiatives, corporate offerings, and their best practices in messaging, medium, and inspiring participation and leadership. During this session, we'll hear from Justin Dreibelbiss, CEO of Texas Wildlife Association, Don Davies, Night Sky Program Manager at Hill Country Alliance, and Leticia Mendoza, Director of Marketing and Communications at Texas Disposal Systems. As a reminder, you can submit your questions via the YouTube stream or at info at texanbynature.org. So please join me in thanking these presenters as we start the panel. Justin. Well, good morning. Thank you so much. Um, Joni, you made me a little nervous with the walk-up song. I was, uh, <laughs> was trying to wonder, I was wondering what you might have picked for me. Uh, first of all, thank you so much, uh, Mrs. Bush, Joni, members of the board for recognizing TWA for our work and for the opportunity to partner with Texan by Nature. We're very excited about it. It's been great so far and, and looking forward to lots of, of uh, other great things to come out of it. Um, so TWA, as I mentioned in the video, uh, was formed in 1985 by a couple of wildlife biologists and a private landowner that wanted to make sure that hunters and landowners had a strong voice on the policy issues that affected them in Austin. Um, and so after a very successful first um, activity as a group, they formalized that partnership and, and 38 years later, we're still operating under the same mission. Although our scope has expanded significantly, our mission's the same. And while it may be a little wordy, it's very accurate for the work that we do. So why, why do we do it? Um, so we live in a private land state, 170 million acres of land mass, 95% uh, privately owned. You break that out, remove the developed portions, and you've got about 83% of the state, 140 million acres. Um, that's rural working land, private ranches, private farms, family forests, all those things where our food and fiber is grown, where our clean water is filtered, where millions of Texans go and recreate every year. It's crucially important to our, to our economy, to our culture, so many things about what we all depend on as Texans. And so um, you break it down another step. You've got about 30 million people in the state. You heard in the video, there's estimates that say there could be 50. 50 million people here in the state over the next 20 years, um, that's a big number. And we're already wondering where water's coming from, all those kind of things. And so it's very important that we make good, thoughtful decisions now for the future of our state. One step further, you've got that 141 million acres that's owned by about 250,000 individuals. That's less than 1% of the state population. Um, the decisions they make are crucially important to all of us. And so TWA feels like that 1% needs to have a voice. And so that's, that's one of the things that we do. At the end of the day, we're trying to make sure that we leave plenty of this and put as little of this in place as we possibly need to. <clears throat> when I drive through Gulfweight in November, I want to see this and I don't want to see this. And, I, and so when, we, when we've got these goals in mind at TWA, we feel like we can accomplish those goals by creating connections to the land for Texans and helping them understand the crucial role that private landowners play in the health and sustainability of our natural resources. 
So here's our project with, with Conservation Wrangler, and it's probably a little different than, than most. We're a 38-year-old organization. It's been established for quite some time. Um, so Joni asked me a very um, profound question when we sat down the first time. She said, do you, she said, um, do you have members because of your programs, or do you have programs because of your members? And the light bulb went off at that time. I was like, well, the answer is clear. We have programs because of our members. In 1985, we built a very core group of members, and as the organization matured, they realized that if they were proactive and went and started creating those connections for Texans, whether it be through some of our education programs or hunting programs or through our advocacy programs, that we're gonna be better off in the long run. And so that's why these programs were started. And so we've built the infrastructure and what we'd really like to do is strategically grow that membership, grow our partnerships with folks like yourself to get our programs out to more Texans. And so that's what we're ultimately trying to do, optimizing our organizational operations through understanding our membership better, through helping our staff understand exactly the role they play in the you know, in the strategy of the organization as we try to accomplish our mission. And at the end of the day, more media visibility and, and marketing of our programs. And so um, here's, here's one um, pretty quick, easy project that, uh, that Amy was able to pump out for us. It's just a map of our membership, how we're scattered around the state. We have about 5,500 members um, that represent some of the largest landowners to folks that live in downtown Dallas that don't own any land, but they care about wild things and wild places, and if, and, uh, if they care about that, then we want them as a TWA member. As I mentioned in the, um, in the video, we have a three-legged stool at TWA, and I'll just kind of walk you through each one of them quickly and talk about impacts and then, and then where, where we're hoping to head. So as I mentioned, uh, issues and advocacy is what the organization was founded on. We advocate for um, policy that's, that's landowner and hunter friendly. Um, we feel that creating an, an environment where a landowner can do the things that we all depend on them for and make good um, ecological decisions on their property is in the best interest of all Texans. So we advocate for um, you know, policy like wildlife tax valuation from 1995. Texas Wildlife Association was very in, um, in the middle of that um, with a bunch of partners that helped us do it. And, um, and that is an example of landowner friendly policy that helps keep families on the land and we think that's a good thing. Um, we work on water issues, right to hunt and fish, those kind of things, wildlife disease management. But, um, but we're gonna focus primarily on the other two legs of our stool today. First and foremost is what we call conservation legacy. It's our natural resource education programs. We focus on youth and adults. We have a wide array of, of youth programs. And it all starts with the specially designed natural resource curriculum that TWA has been working on with our partners for a long time. Um, we have ready-made lessons for teachers around the state to use, um, covering uh, a wide array of natural resource topics. Um, we have trunks with ready-made lessons that we ship in and out of the office every day that can be checked out for um, a couple of weeks at a time. We have conservation educators scattered around the state that go into classrooms and teach those lessons. We have distance learning. We have a, a quarterly publication we call Critter Connections. It's a youth um, wildlife natural resource magazine. Um, and then we also have a program called Expeditions where we have a, a family portion on private land. We also have a school, um, school student expeditions that's basically a series of natural resource education programs that culminates in a field trip on a working ranch. In our mind, that is the perfect learning environment to cut through all of the over information that we were just talking about and help those students understand and wrap their arms around the concepts they've been learning in their classroom. So um, adult education, we focus very heavily on landowner workshops, trying to get the most um, up-to-date quality land management information in the hands of landowners so they can make informed decisions. And the mantra of our leadership has always been yellow school buses on private land. And so that's really what we operate on through Conservation Legacy is trying to create that connection to the land. And we've been very, um, been very fortunate. Um, I kind of um, flew through that last slide there, but we've, um, over the last 15 years, through our various programs, have been able to reach over 5 million Texans through um, various different programs. And 
The programs that take the most effort and the most time end up affecting the smallest number. It's just, a, it's just how it works. But at the end of the day, there's a place for each one of these types of education. So our Critter Connections publication, um, we've, we've distributed over two million of them in the last 15 years. It's one of those things, it's a quick, easy item. It's not going to create a full-on conservation ambassador, but it's going to open the door and we see some real value in that. And so we also have programs for them to take the next step and participate with the programs. Um, so the last leg of our stool is our hunting heritage program. So a recent A&M study shows that just whitetail hunting in the state of Texas results in $4.3 billion of annual expenditures from hunters and landowners. It's an, enormous, uh, it's an enormous economic driver, especially for rural Texas, and it's one that we believe is good for other species and good for our natural resources. And so some forward thinking uh, members back in, the, back in the 80s put together some programs that um, in, in our mind recruit and retain that next generation of Texas hunter. The Texas Youth Hunting Program that I talked about in the video, um, just to give you an idea of impact, we've had 230 hunts last year on private land, um, and this year we'll have, we'll actually hit our 30,000 um, individual hunter mark. Uh, and it's a number we're very proud of. And again, these, these trips with a youth hunter and their guardian create another opportunity for a connection with the land and a connection with one another in nature. Texas Big Game Awards is another partnership with Texas Parks and Wildlife Department that was started in the early 90s. It's essentially a social support program for hunters where we reinforce positive first experience in the field for these youth hunters, create opportunities for hunters to stay engaged in the, in the community. And we've recognized over 60,000 hunters and landowners um, for good habitat management and um, celebrating our hunting heritage since the early 90s. And the last, last but not least is our, newest, is our newest hunting outreach program called our Adult Learn to Hunt program. We've had this really large demand for adults that are interested in a program very similar uh, to our Texas Youth Hunting Program because they, there's a growing number of people that didn't grow up hunting. They're very interested in where their food's coming from and what a better way to connect with the land than to, than to have a safe, educational, ethical hunting experience. And so that's what we've been providing. We were able to start the program um, all the way last year, had 100 new participants, um, and um, the program is going very well. But again, it goes back to creating connections with the land, and that's what we're trying to do with all of our natural resource education and hunting programs. So um, in closing, ways to get involved. Um, the fact that we're all here today, I feel like we're all on the same team, we're coming from different directions, and I think there's lots of opportunity to partner. You know, we're looking to grow our membership to grow our impact. We're also looking to grow our partnerships to grow our impact, and we feel like we've got a, a substantial amount of infrastructure built on both of these programs that we think can really, um, that we can really spread the word quickly if we all work together. And so I'd love to talk to folks that may be interested in partnering with us on some of these programs um, and just helping us spread the word um, about, about what we're doing. So that's really kind of um, what I would end with. Please um, reach out to us. The, we've got our Texas Wildlife Association crew right here in the middle. I've got our president, Jonathan Letts, and um, several of our staff members. So please uh, look us up today. We'd love to, love to visit with you. And thank you so much for having us. Well, first, I want to say thank you uh, to Ms. Bush, to Joni, to the board, and especially to the staff of Texan by Nature, um, and particularly Kenzie, who's been working with us tirelessly on our Conservation Wrangler program for Hill Country Alliance. I want you to take a moment and think back to a point in your life where you recall being under starry skies. And I'm talking dark, starry skies, the type where you can make out too many stars to even really determine constellations, where you can see the Milky Way, and in some cases, maybe the Milky Way casts a shadow. I'm curious, how many of you have that memory, that recollection? For how many of you is it recent? 
for how many of you can you step off your porch or your back stoop and still see the Milky Way? So considerably less. <laughs> Those numbers are pretty much on par with what we are seeing in the latest trends. Over 80% of our global population lives under light polluted skies. And that's upwards of 90 to 99% just here in the state of Texas. And one third of our global population lives where they cannot see the Milky Way. We're losing the night sky at upwards of a rate of 10% each year, whereas we formerly thought it was 2%. And it's not hard to see from these satellite images. In fact, when we get in closer to the state of Texas, you don't even have to work very hard to see the outlines of our cities. There's not much to guess there. I'd like to say the stars at night are clear and bright, but they are not. We estimate that roughly 35% of all outdoor exterior light is shining up into the night sky unnecessarily. This is costing us in the United States about $4.5 billion every year, globally $50 billion. And here in the state of Texas, over 350 million at least. It's roughly costing us in CO2 emissions upwards of 15 million tons per year. It's escalating the uh, air pollution. It's, it's an unnecessary waste. We find it's affecting our nocturnal pollinators. Most people think of pollination, they think of bees, which is very true, uh, but actually nocturnal beetle pollination is responsible for over 80% of pollination of over 240,000 plant species worldwide. We've also found that over 21 endemic species are on the endangered species list just in the hill country, and all species, regardless of whether they can see, regardless of whether they are underground in caves, all species that live and breathe are affected by light pollution. We're finding it's impeding agriculture processes. We're finding plants are uh, overproducing during photosynthesis, which is extending their cycles. Uh, we're finding that the plants react heavily to the lack of light and dark changes. In some cases, agriculture is affected upwards of 30 to 40% diminished yields over time. For most of us, we may have trouble sleeping, and for most of us, that's most likely, or at least partially due to light pollution. Even the littlest bit of light pollution has been known to affect melatonin production, which, production, which happens at night, uh, therefore disrupting our circadian rhythms and increasing risk of cancer, obesity, and a various uh, multitude of other illnesses and issues health-wise. We find it in cityscapes, light cluttering, light that is uh, coming from street signs, from street lights, from buildings. Uh, we find it in light trespass. I'm sure at least some of you, if not a fair portion, have all had an instance where light from either a next door neighbor or an outdoor street light has invaded your bedroom at night. And obviously light glare, which is one of the most dangerous forms of light pollution because it is at a risk uh, to our safety. We're finding science is restricted. Uh, most of you are probably familiar with Lights Out Texas um, and the protection of birds, particularly during peak spring and fall bird migration. Uh, but it is also hindering a lot of other scientific research, especially here in the state of Texas, a lot of work that's being done by astronomers, particularly at the McDonald Observatory. Tourism is threatened. Uh, in just the last 10 years or so, astrotourism has become a very popular uh, term. and. Uh, Regardless, it's, it's being threatened in our hill country where so many people come to visit because of the heritage, because of the night skies. Uh, and it's causing a loss of inspiration. Uh, just recently at a conference, I learned of a new term I was not familiar with, which is awe deprivation. We have lost the ability to be in awe of our night sky. So what are we doing about it? What's been done? So in 20, uh, 2014, Hill Country Alliance was founded on the principles of securing and maintaining and bringing together organizations in conservation for land protection, for water protection. Uh, eventually, night sky preservation was added to that. Shortly after that, the Texas chapter of 
what was formerly called the International Dark Sky Association was formed, now Dark Sky International. And then over the course of the next 20 years, uh, we saw increases in preservation around the Hill Country, international dark sky places being designated, groups forming, conferences being convened, uh, the Texas Night Sky Festival, people coming together with the common goal, the common need to return to the night sky, to find what we had been losing and what we continue to lose. Um, it's progressed rather rapidly over the years, but there's still a lot to be accomplished. There's still a lot just within our small neck of the woods of the Hill Country uh, that we still need to protect, let alone the rest of the state of Texas. Uh, but we've done so with many partnerships, with many conservation organizations uh, that are like-minded in our overall mission. And we've been tremendously successful, but there's, there's still a lot of work to be done. So one of the areas that we uh, are most prideful of, and rightfully so, are friends groups that have either formed independently uh, through partner organizations such as Dark Sky Texas, um, or have had the support of Hill Country Alliance in being created. Uh, we currently have 15 throughout the Hill Country. We'll be adding one more at the end of the year. And over the next year, we expect to increase that with another five more, reaching upwards of 20 to 21 friends groups. These are all volunteers individuals that are like-minded in our mission um, and go out into the community to not only educate and provide outreach but also work with their local government with their local leadership to pass ordinances and bring uh, for lack of a better term to light this issue we have in the state of Texas 21 international dark sky places. We are actually the second uh, state with the largest number right behind Utah and uh, out of that, 13 of those dark sky places are here in the Hill Country. And we are fortunate that within the next three to five years, that number will more than double. We have 15 that are currently in the process of completing or uh, undergoing the application process. We also work, as I said, with a lot of municipalities. We have passed ordinances and have helped to support uh, communities that have. But if you take a look at this map, there's still a lot of the Hill Country area to assist in that process. Uh, just recently, within the last year, the city of Kerrville uh, has adopted their first outdoor lighting ordinance. And we've been successful in making change in the city of San Antonio to also improve lighting around the military bases, thus helping to further support the mission of the Campbell Sentinel landscape. But again, there's still a lot to be done. So within our friends groups, they do outreach, they go to farmer's markets, they hold events, they educate, they work very closely with their respective communities, with their adjacent friends groups uh, in all forms of education, not just uh, in passing out pamphlets, but presenting and reading books. We work with children, with youth, with other groups such as uh, Kiwanis Clubs, Lions Clubs, Texas Master Naturalists, pretty much anyone and everyone who's willing to listen to us about light pollution. Um, and it, it has made great traction. We have seen the movement grow, but there is still a lot left to be accomplished. Um, we found a lot of success in uh, just one-on-one -on -one communication, talking with folks directly, hosting star parties that get people out under the night sky and understanding what it is that we're trying to protect while in the environment. So we've just finished the month of October, which is Hill Country Night Sky Month. We uh, just had our fourth annual one, and this is an opportunity for our friends groups and our partners and those in the community to really leverage and build up the momentum around night sky preservation, uh, whether it's holding events, whether it's pre putting up press releases, news information. Uh, we have full moon howls. We have moonlight dancing under the stars. Uh, we even have communities that are undertaking candlelight dinners. Um, and one of the things that's been tremendously beneficial in our partnership with uh, Texan by Nature and the Conservation Wrangler Program has been working to help build our message and build our brand to further uh, the next four, eight, 10, 12 years of Hill Country Night Sky Months. 
So what can you do? How can you take this information and move forward if you're not previously aware of light pollution or the issue? We have the five principles of uh, responsible lighting. And it's very common sense sort of things, but a lot of lighting is out of sight, out of mind. So it's proper shielding, it's proper temperature, it's using the light only when is necessary. There's a lot of information out there. This is a really great diagram of what's acceptable and unacceptable lighting, and I do apologize. It's a bit of a curse and a blessing because once you know what poor lighting looks like, you see it everywhere. <laughs> sorry, not sorry. <laughs> So I have the ways you can help. Become a member of Dark Sky International. Become a member of Dark Sky Texas. Visit our Dark Sky places, support them. Find ways to become an advocate for night sky preservation in your community. Reach out to folks like us at Hill Country Alliance or go to our website where you can learn about how to be a part of the movement, where you can learn about uh, ordinances in your area, where you can learn about friends groups you can particularly join, um, where you can learn pretty much as much information as we can provide for you, including types of lighting that you could utilize in your own home, in your own space. So as I said, we have 15 friends groups. They're all over the Hill Country. I encourage you to seek them out if they're in your area. If you're ambitious, you can form one yourself and we are always here to help along with our other partners as well. But really what it comes down to is, as was said by a formal, former uh, head of Dark Sky International, Ken Katner, that the Texas Hill Country is one of the fastest growing regions for night sky preservation. But light pollution to many is still a very new terminology. It's still a very new concept. Uh, but it is no less important and no less dire situation than air pollution and water pollution and land pollution. Uh, and it's at the same level of risk. So we need to do everything we can, we need to communicate with everybody we can to preserve the natural heritage and the pristine night skies that we have in this hill country and try to reclaim those that we've lost. Try to continue to be on the edge of night and push that line further and further away so we can appreciate and we can have more recent memories of the night sky and the stars above. Thank you so much to the Texas by Nature program for Conservation Wrangler because without them, uh, we would not be making the quick advances that we are in night sky preservation, in the work, in communicating this uh, to our general area and now to you folks as well. Uh, I guess I just wanna end that, you know, anyone can be a steward of the night sky and anyone can participate and be as active as they want to be. We just hope that you will consider turning off your light and turning on the night. Thank you. Next slide, please. Good morning. My name is Leticia Mendoza. I am the Director of Marketing and Communications for Texas Disposal Systems. And I am so honored and privileged to be here with all of you, business owners, community leaders, my fellow panelists, Joni, the Texan by Nature um, team, and especially Mrs. Laura Bush. Thank you so much. I'm gonna be talking a little bit about how Texas Disposal System is making a difference and sharing three examples of how we are doing that in our community. How we are empowering our community through education, engagement, and putting it that into action. So if you don't know who Texas Disposal Systems, let me enlighten you. Um, we are located in Creedmoor, Texas, that is just south of Austin, Texas. We, are, we were founded in 1977 by one employee and one truck. Um, we, are, uh, we operate out of 2,300 acres, and we are the first fully integrated facility of its kind in the state of Texas permitted for solid waste disposal, recycling operations, and compost production. 
So one of the things that I've learned by being with TDS is that not a lot of people think about where does their waste go. You think about where you're gonna go shopping for groceries, you think about where you're going to send your kids to school, but not often are you thinking about how am I going to take care of the environment? Well, maybe the people in this group do, but in general, no. So that poses a challenge. You know, we operate out of 92 counties in Texas, mostly in central Texas, but how are we connecting with, um, with, our, or with our youth, with our adults, um, and also with our community? And so these examples that I'll be sharing here with you today is how we are doing that. And I'm gonna use the example of where we work, where we live, and where we play. So our TDS Eco Academy, we launched this in 2017, um, and it was a program designed to help minimize waste and the impact in our schools. We started this program to really connect with the schools and make sure not only did we, we didn't want to just be a service hauler to the schools, but really create a connection to them and be a partner in the schools. We enlisted the help of curriculum specialists to help us create TEKS aligned curriculum that would be meaningful for the teachers and staff and leadership to adopt into their practices, not just from a service level, but also from an education and training. Um, we are proud that we have 14 school districts, that's 324 campuses and 246,000 students that we service every single day um, throughout the year in the state of Texas. So how do we do that? Because we had some lofty goals. We wanted to be an education resource for students, teachers, um, and educators. We wanted to support our education in local communities by teaching, uh, while teaching these future generations about responsible environmental stewardship and engaging them, but also showing TDS as the primary source and an industry leader in resource management. So I talked about a little bit engaging a curriculum specialist because I'm married to a teacher, so I know what they're looking for, but I'm not an expert in that. So we really enlisted the help of curriculum specialists to really help us understand and do focus groups with teachers. How can we get you to engage this curriculum? What is going to make it easy for you? We heard loud and clear, it needs to be TEKS aligned and it must be bilingual, not only for the teachers and the students, but also for the staff who is working um, in, in our school cafeterias and around campus. We also created classroom posters to create what we're doing in the cafeterias to also connect it with what we're doing inside of the classrooms. Here's that cafeteria example of how we're doing lunchroom bin, bin decals and signage. Um, we also train, train the staff from the custodians to the cafeteria, and in, on occasion we are invited by the schools to visit with the students and do a five minute break challenge to really assess their, their diversion knowledge. But lastly, one of the biggest things that we heard from all of our school districts that would really set us apart in this, in this space is how are we creating monthly diversion reports that they can see true change that they are doing. Um, and so we invested as a company in our trucks that no other hauler that we know of in our, in our region, we invested in putting weights so that we could truly go out there and lift, and lift, the, lift the, um, the carts and really get a true, true knowledge of what we're, where we're diverting from them. Um, this also helped us when we're doing audits to be able to teach the schools about who's doing great in their school district and who has some opportunities so that they can learn from one another. And of course, every program has its challenges. Um, for us, knowing that we have 14 school districts, I will tell you, nowhere across the board is procurement the same. So not only are we creating curriculum and signage that is specific to each school district, but we're really trying to work with them and advising and consulting these school districts about getting on the, on the same playing field so that they are truly doing more diversion and creating smaller opportunities for what goes into the landfill. By doing some audits, by also working at looking at what the school districts are receiving in their, in their, um, in their waste, also looking at awareness and adoption from um, the custodial team, faculty, staff, and especially leadership so that they get behind why are we doing this. We do on-site training and of course looking at how do we get teachers to integrate this curriculum into what's already a really jam-packed um, year for them. So that's on the work. 
Now, where do we live? How do we engage with our residents? I talked about us having 92 different counties that we work with. Each city has their own, their own guidelines, and we're working within that and consulting them, but we wanted to really look at how do we engage with our community. So we invested in 2018 to launch the TDS Waste Wizard app. What does this do? We wanted to make sure that it was user focused, data driven, it would change behavior and also build trust that what we are telling them is what is happening in their community and how they can be involved in creating change. Because we all know in this room that recycling is really complicated. Not many people have seen what a MRF or their operations look like. And if you're ever in Central Texas, I invite you to look me up and I'm happy to take you on a tour because you will be awed. <laughs> um, we also know with recycling being so complicated that when we're trying to aim for zero contamination, that is asking our residents to be able to learn hundreds, maybe even thousands of items on how to do that. It's complicated. They don't necessarily know, but people generally want to do the right thing. And so we wanted to put it at their fingertips how they can do that right thing. So we invested in this app to be able to help them search for those items that are commonly mistaken. Why? Because when they're searching Google, looking for how do I dispose of X, we know that this could lead to more phone calls that we have to man. This also means that they're leading to more persistent mistakes and wish cycling because again, they want to do the right thing but don't know how to do that which then ends up resulting in contamination um, and, loss, and loss, losing an engagement opportunity with them. So we wanted to gamify it too, because learning is fun and adults can also learn. Um, and so our EcoSort game really looks at um, challenges and what's happening in their community. And if I'm more than anything, I'm shocked that um, people are really engaging with this, with this app and playing for over seven minutes. So, and I only took, and this might be a slide that's a little harder to read, but I wanted just to crop and highlight the top five items that when people are playing this game, what are we learning on the back end from it? We are looking at what are the most commonly mistaken items that they are looking for. So if you see here, you see concrete, soiled pizza boxes, coffee cups, mattresses. Um, and so what do we do with that? We want to continue further educating you, which through the app, we're able to push communication. We're able to give you educational tips, use our social media and our blogs to be able to engage with our, with our community about the questions that they have right now. So I'm sharing this with you too about our total estimated uh, diversion. I wanted to be able to prove a case study to my leadership team that this app that we invested in that is free for all of our residents to use, how is it working? And while this, this is looking at the entire company across the board, I think there's correlation to looking at that. If you can see, we launched in 2018, we were about 320,000 in total tons diverted. And if you fast forward to the end of 2021, we're at 441,000 tons diverted from our landfill. Thank you. So now we look at where do we play? Where do we engage with the broader community? Maybe you're not a TDS customer, but one day you as a youth, you become a resident. You become a resident in our community and you become a homeowner. You're also a business person and you're working, but then you're also gonna be enjoying life and working in the community. So how are we creating this full circle approach where it becomes second nature for you so that we stop the wish cycling, but we continue to do the right thing? How do we continue to educate our community? So we look for partnerships and I'm using Austin FC as our, as our newest and most proudest um, partnership that we have where we are the official waste and recycling partner on how we um, engage and educate the community there and our fans. We do that through on-site activations. We also have what we call eco stations. You probably saw, and I'll go back. We have a three stream, three stream system. And if you can tell, the landfill bin is a lot smaller. Why? We're doing that on purpose. We want to show you that we do not want more landfill in there. Instead, we want to be doing more diversion in composting and recycling. And we follow the Disney model. Every 30 feet, you will find one of these eco stations. We want to make it convenient for you to help us recycle and compost. We also have what we call our TDS employees. We're affectionately known as trash goalies at these games. 
That's right, and we even wear gloves. Um, we engage with the fans. We celebrate when they're doing things right, and then we also use that opportunity to say, oh, you want to put it in this one, and it creates this conversation with them where it's very gentle, but it's also a lot of fun. And when they ask us, what are you doing? We're decked out in our trash goalies. We're like, we're helping, you know, divert these, divert the waste. Um, we also host a sustainability breakfast where we're able to engage with our business owners, sponsors, and we can talk about and celebrate the big wins that Austin FC is doing and how we can do that together. And more importantly, as sponsors or business owners, how can they become more involved to help Austin FC further their mission and goals? We also look at how we're doing diversion reporting. Again, we invested in the weights in our trucks it was really important to Austin FC to, tr to show true measure, not only to their fans, but also the city of Austin who has a, a, a one, zero waste goal by, 20, by 2040. And then on the back side, the things that you don't see is our employee, employee training, making sure that they're also aware that they're also helping on the back end and that they understand the why that we're doing on the front end is also happening on the back end. So here's some really great um, performance metrics. Um, the average game diversion for Austin FC is 76%. When we have trash goalies present at the games, their highest game diversion has been 91%. So we know engagement and education works. In 2023, we diverted 191 tons. And then a great partnership with Yeti, they, they chose to bring in three cisterns located with water across, across the stadium where they allow fans to bring in their own reusable Yeti cups or, or Yeti bottles or any bottle, honestly. And Austin FC made the really um, tough choice of taking an economic impact by selling less water bottles and allowing people to bring in their water bottles. And with that, that choice that they made there, they were able to avert 59,000 water bottles from the waste stream. So we want people to be involved, we want the fans to know what's going on, and we want to be transparent about what is happening. And so uh, located along the stadium, and one thing that we really promote is you know, following our QR code, which you're welcome to do that. They host 17 games and about five friendlies throughout the year that we continue to do the same actions that we're doing. So we are engaging with not only fans that belong here in Austin, but also educating fans that are coming and visiting Austin. So I leave you with, what are we going to do, right? Why all of this? I believe that everyone here in this room wants to do the right thing as well. And together we can continue to build a more sustainable future. We have an opportunity here where there are business owners, leaders, community stakeholders, individuals who definitely want to do the right thing and work together. Let's use the network that we have to amplify the programs that my fellow panelists are doing and with TDS and do it bigger for Texas. Thank you. Thank you, Justin, Don, and Leticia. We have time for a few questions from the audience. Um, and if you're virtual, you can submit them via the YouTube stream or info at texanbynature.org. Oh, they'll give you the mic. Oh. Hi there. Hi. I'm a resident of New Braunfels. I don't know if you cover us. Um, we don't. The city of New Braunfels has, has their own um, trucking fleet, but we want you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I want one of those composting bins because we don't get we don't have one of those. Mm -hmm. So we throw like our pizza boxes and, mm -hmm. um, into the trash bin, and, and over time, have reduced the trash. I mean, we don't have as much trash. We we don't need these giant bins. Right. But when I go out and cut the uh, citrus in the backyard with all those thorns. I'd love to have a giant bin just to cut it in. So um, I guess we need to talk to the city of New Braunfels, right? Yes. <laughs> and then we're happy to come and talk to them too. I know that we've had conversations with the city of New Braunfels. We've even tried to at least come in from a commercial standpoint because we know change can be hard, especially with the growth that is happening in New Braunfels. But we want to make it easier for them. And again, we want to be a partner. And as we're creeping, creeping through, I mean, we're partners with everyone from Creedmoor, where then we're going to Buda, Kyle, San Marcos, 
let's get new Braunfels and then connect the dots between what we already do in San Antonio. I think what you're doing is fantastic. And thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I would add that the TWA office is in New Braunfels and we need some trash goalies. Yes. <laughs> Um, thank you so much for all of your presentations, Leticia. I love that you laid out um, the ways and the strategies that you go and making things accessible. And so my question is, um, how do you go with, with everyone in the panelists? How do you go about making sure all programs are accessible for everyone um, and making sure there's limited barriers for people either in um, urbanized areas or maybe that don't have um, traditionally knowledge of dark skies or hunting or uh, what conservation is? If you'd like to start, Justin, and then we can go down the line. Sure. Um, I, I would say that that's, you know, on the forefront of our mind all the time is trying to make it as accessible as possible. Um, I think our conservation education program and trying to go to the schools, um, I think, is one of those ways to let people know, let kids know that, hey, this is, this is important information for you. Everybody needs to understand it, and uh, we all have a part to play in, in um you know, helping manage our natural resources. Um, you know, on the on the hunting outreach programs, um, it's it's a matter of just trying to trying to get the word out. Um, you know, first time participants in our programs are always taken first, um, and so it's it really is. It's it's fully accessible. It's just a matter of getting the word out and letting people know that. Mm -hmm. You know, similar to what Justin said, you know, it is a challenge. Uh, we're very fortunate to have a fair bit of documentation that comes from Dark Sky International that's translated into three other languages. We're working to do the same in translation of a lot of our night sky information with Hill Country Alliance into Spanish from a very first uh, beginning phase. But a lot of it is really dependent on our friends groups and our volunteers. They know their community best. They know the people that live there and they do a tremendous job in getting to the corners of their cities and their communities that are not uh, as heavily reached. Uh, we work with other organizations uh, where we try to bring equity and inclusion into night sky preservation um, and just ensure that nobody is left out of uh, the conversation, is left out of opportunity to observe the night sky and find a way to help us defend it. And I used our two examples with the schools and our community partnerships, but I think that that's, that's an opportunity that we use. I only used Austin SD as an example, but we really look at what community festivals are going on, um, what larger partnerships can we have where there are tons of people. So at Austin SC, they have a stadium for 23,000 people. You know, Texas uh, DKR um, at, at UT, which we're also a sponsor of, they have over 100,000 seats. And so we know that we're getting that many people that we can impact with. And so we use those opportunities to not only do their services so that we can connect the dots between the brand and the service that we're doing, but also doing the right thing in the community. We are taking those opportunities to tell them who we are and what we're trying to do and how, can they can, how they can also get engaged. And one of those ways that we do it is we do a newsletter. And our newsletter isn't necessarily talking everything about like this is how great TDS is, but more about what is, what's in it for you, right? What do you need to learn and how you can connect us? And then maybe add in there how we can help you with that further. But more than anything, we just want to connect so that people have the information at their fingertips and we're reaching them whether we're in person, through email, through an app, or in your schools. Rick Archer with Overland. Uh, we are working with a client that is major uh, restaurant F&B, uh, and they are composting everything, they're recycling, but there seems to be a missing piece in the waste management stream, which is what do we do with food waste? And so we've got this ecosystem where they're existing almost like a hothouse plant without any place to take that. Can you talk about what's being done about food waste in the state and how we might be able to connect with a larger ecosystem? Mm. I'll take that. <laughs> yeah, Leticia, that one's for you. <laughs> 
I can't speak to the whole state of Texas, but I can speak about what we're doing at TDS um, out of our operations. Um, we definitely do take food waste. Um, specific, I'll, I'll use Austin um, as an example. Um, Austin has a URO, uh, Universal Recycling Ordinance, where food waste is very much a part of that plan. Um, of course, we would love to be able to take more food waste because we also have our retail arm, Gardenville, where we sell mulch, soils, compost that we generate out of the food waste that we are picking up from our schools and our commercial businesses, including restaurants. But I think one of the things that the URO um, in Austin is really calling for is that restaurants, um, and specifically, are looking at what their waste generating looks like so that they can adjust their plans so that they do still need to have some sort of composting plan for their waste, but what are they doing to reduce the amount that they are also putting in there? Yeah, well, we're definitely doing that, but the problem is we're create, we have a really vast ecosystem that creates a slurry out of food waste and it gets recycled, but there's no one that wants it. We want it. <laughs> All right, we're in San Antonio, we're gonna connect. Yes, please. Uh, yes, I have a conundrum, I'm kind of a, well, I recycle everything, and my kids are always on me because I'm extreme, but I'm very worried because you s hear about that island as big as Texas in the mm -hmm. Pacific that's nothing but plastics, and I always hear, oh, you're recycling, but it's going to end up in the ocean, and I know we used to give a lot of our recyclables to underdeveloped countries that would just dump it in the ocean, and you see these beaches that are solid plastics that are a horror, and I just want to know what happens to what I'm recycling. I recycle everything. Is it ending up in the ocean or is it truly getting recycled in this country? Mm -hmm. I think that's a challenge that a lot of people are asking themselves as well. Um, at, at TDS, um, we take a lot of pride in being transparent in our operations. Everything that comes through our facility, um, through our MRF, gets recycled. And more importantly, we do not want to send it overseas. It is all done um, here domestically, and we will hold it. We have 2,300 acres where we can do that. So you might come to our facility and do a tour and say, what are these stacked bales doing here? We're waiting for the, um, the commodity market to adjust so that we can sell it at the right price because it's still a business, but we want to do the right thing and keep it here. We don't want recycling that ends up going overseas so that it becomes a little McDonald's toy and then we throw it back into recycling and it goes back to the other country to come back. That's not recycling. Um, so we do not send it to the ocean. We, we're very conscious about who, um, who we sell to as well, and I think that that's really important. Um, I know that there's other um, leaders here, uh, I'll use Coca-Cola as an example, who's really looking um, and being very specific about who they're working with as an, as an end user who's going to recycle that product and how it comes back into our, into our community. So, uh, just to expand on that, so I live in San Antonio, we have all the bins, so are you all active in San Antonio? Do my recyclables go to you guys, or I wonder where it goes? We get 30% of San Antonio's um, waste stream. Yes. And I think um, I have one more question, and we'll do one minute for each panelist, but we'd like to know, What's one thing that you recommend attendees take home to try in education and outreach and decision making uh, for conservation? Um, I, I, I guess I would say that um, I learned very early in my career to um, surround myself with smart people, smart, like-minded people and um, not really worry about who's getting the credit because if, you, if you're working towards the same goal, uh, there's going to be plenty to go around. And so I would just say I'm very excited about all the people in this room, very diverse interests. Um, and I, I think just educating our next generation of Texans about the value of, of our natural resources is going to make them make better decisions when, when they turn on the tap, when they go to the voting booth, all those things. And so um, I'm just excited to you know build on those partnerships. Yeah, very similarly, education, um, you know, 
for most of us, we live in homes that have a multitude of exterior lights that often we turn on when we leave our house and we turn on when we go to sleep, but it's out of sight, out of mind. We're, we're never around them. So there might be lights already that you're aware of in your home that might need to be replaced or changed out. So first, very root, it's, you know, walking the walk and talking the talk and uh, taking the time to see what your relationship is with the night sky and communicating it very much with youth. I find that there's nothing more compelling than a child who is interested in a subject and won't stop talking about it. So really, <laughs> if we can get the education to our children, if we can have the conversation with our neighbors, even if it's just in passing, it plants that seed and it, it grows. I, I would I would echo everything that they do say here, but also building those partnerships. I mean, Don talked about you know who's walking the talk, right? There's a lot of us here in this room who really care. So what are we doing, right? Looking at who's sponsoring, who's in the community doing doing what they're doing. This is not a competition. This should be more about collaboration and empowering um, each other to do to do better together. Thank you again, uh, Justin, Dawn, and Leticia. <laughs> Kenzie, Laura, Ashley, and Jesse, if you'd like to come up. It's not exactly the lake everybody thinks about. It's more of a wetland system. Small rivers, bayous, flooded